your Bibles, grab them or a device and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're continuing our series as we walk verse by verse through this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to uh, Christians, the church in Corinth. What if somebody came to church this morning, they walked in, some guy, and he had a chain around his neck, and uh, uh, on that chain was uh, this symbol. What if I told you... Um, Next week I'm going to Japan and I got my traveling outfit ready to go and here's the shirt I'm wearing as I travel to Japan next week. Now some of you don't even know how to take it. You know that your pastor likes to joke around and different things, but this isn't funny, right? This, there's an embarrassment. There's symbols that we see that cause a reaction in our minds. And uh, it can be one of embarrassment, one of horror, one of shock. And um, in the first century... When the Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church in Corinth some 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, the cross was a symbol that would bring about the same sort of reaction that you just had to those other symbols. The cross was a symbol of torture, of pain, of shame. Crucifixion was used ruthlessly by the Roman Empire, and they used it to dissuade anybody, any enemies or anybody that would stand against them, dissuade them from their rebellion. They crucified people along the Appian Way, a stretch of road from Rome, out of Rome, um, some 6,000 people on each side of the road who would take days to die as they hung on a, on a cross. The, the cross was a symbol of brutality. The cross was a symbol of, of death and punishment and destruction. But in our day and age, we see the cross all over the place. We see the cross on the sides of buildings. We see cross earrings. We see cross in the sanctuary. We, we see the image of the cross, and we don't think anything of it. I saw a YouTube video where a, a, a lady, a porn pornographer, actress, was being interviewed, and she had a cross necklace on, and the interviewer said, are you a Christian? Why do you have that cross necklace on? She's like, I can believe whatever I want. I don't, I'm not a Christian. I just like the cross. So it's hard for us in our day and age to understand the audacity of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, which reads, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. What Paul says in this verse um, will change your world and your eternity forever. The cross, a subject of uh, scorn and shame and folly, was actually the means by which God redeems mankind. We are in 1 Corinthians, and just as a quick recap, we looked at the first 17 verses. We looked at the first at the greeting, verses 1 through 3, a typical greeting in the first century that the Apostle Paul writes to this church in Corinth, the church which he started, by the way. You can read about it in Acts chapter 18. And he started this church in Corinth, and this was going to be a great, Lord willing, a great place for the gospel to take root, for a church to be planted in a dark world, in a dark place, in the Roman Empire, to be in this city of Corinth. Corinth existed for centuries, even before, as a Greek city, but now the Romans had destroyed that and had rebuilt it as a Roman, um, a Roman colony which had progressed into a a metropolitan area that had great luxury and great success and a diversity of people and a diversity of ideas. And just to remind you where this was located, Josh did a great job. Josh does our our tech stuff back there, and he made up uh, um, a picture of where Corinth is. We can zoom in on Google Earth uh, where Corinth actually is. So you see the Mediterranean Sea there, and now we'll go closer in between Italy to the west, Turkey to the east, and Corinth is right there with two parts, two ports, two harbors uh, that people converged upon this city. Now the problem with this is that uh, this church had problems. This church had issues. We saw verses four through nine, the apostle Paul thanks them for their faith. He builds them up, but then he gets to verse 10 and he brings up the first issue of the church, the first issue of the letter, divisions in the church, that we, what we looked at last week. And now we come to verse 18 and following where he's going to get the people to remember uh, who they are in Christ Jesus and to remember the foundational belief that they have that has set them apart from other peoples, to call them back to following Christ in a renewed way by looking at 
the cross. This symbol of shame, this symbol of, um, of powerlessness becomes a, a symbol of power for these people. So let me pray, and then we'll jump in. Thank you, Lord, for this time. And I, I ask again um, that you would be our teacher and that you would speak your words uh, to each person here today. Lord, I got nothing in myself, and I pray that my words and my thoughts that aren't yours would uh, dissipate and that your truth would come out and that I would receive it and we each would receive it um, with conviction this morning and so that we would be changed ultimately by the cross. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. There's three um, paragraphs uh, that you, you see in the text. The first paragraph, verses 18 through 25, we're gonna talk about the power of the cross. The second paragraph, verses 26 through 31, the end of the chapter, we're gonna look at the people of the cross. And then the first five verses of chapter two talk about the proclaimer of the cross. But first, let's start here. The power of the cross. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. Verse 19, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In verse 18, the Apostle Paul uses a pun. You can't quite see it in the English, but he uses uh, the word in verse 17 uh, for eloquent words of wisdom. I did not come to you with eloquent words of wisdom, or literally, I didn't come to you with the wisdom of words. And now he comes in verse 18, um, but I come with you to you with the word of the cross. So not with the wisdom of words, but the word of the cross. The message of the cross divides the entire human race absolutely. That's what it does. The message of the cross divides all of us, the entire human race, absolutely. In the first century, there were people of all different types of classifications, but the biggest one was if you were slave or free. Did you know in the Roman Empire that over 50% of its citizens were slaves? Over 50% of the people in the Roman Empire were slaves. And so you had the Romans. The Romans uh, were in control of the Western world at the time. And so within the Roman system, you had free people and slavery, slave people. You also had the Greeks. The Greeks um, were around. They were Greek-speaking people. They were welcome in the Roman Empire. They were part of Corinth and no doubt part of the church. And then you had Jewish people. You had Jews that lived there that were scattered all over the place. They gathered in synagogues. That's how um, the Apostle Paul would get the church started. He'd go show up at a town, he'd find the closest synagogue, and he'd start there. If they rejected him, he'd move on to Gentile folks who would, would receive the message of the cross. But did you notice? Look at the text. The word of the cross is what to those who are perishing? What is the word of the cross? Folly. To those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is what? Power of God. Let's try that one more time, okay? This is how I keep you awake, okay? So the word of the cross is what to the perishing? Folly. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. It's two different classifications of people. They're, we're divided. They're divided. What are some classifications of people that we have in our world today? Audience participation. Um, just what are some ways that we look at people, we categorize, we classify people in our society? Democrats and Republicans. How dare you bring that up in this season of life, <laughs> Deb? But that's true. So how many people are Democrats here? Raise your hand. Just kidding. Uh, no. But yeah, we divide up political parties. And uh, what else? Married or single. Married or single. That's definitely a thing. And for us who've been married for a long time, we, f we forget what it's like to be single, right? 
And you got to find your way around that world. Then you get married and you, you're in that world, in that club, in that tribe. What else? Male, female. Male, female. And that's very fluid these days. So that, you know, you can, uh, um, just kidding. Um, but absolutely, male, female. What else? What's that? Poor. So classification of what you have or what you don't have, right? Middle class is a big class society in our, in our society, in our culture. There's basically, we're going to see later on, there's, there's like no middle class in the first century. There was nobility and they had all the wealth and then there was the low class. There's slaves. Um, what else? How about, nobody said this, race. Your skin color. Do we classify that? The language that you speak, right? Um, city, country. Absolutely. So you have all of these uh, things. And we're Village Bible Church. We're a non-denominational church, but there's, at one time it was a big deal. I don't, I don't hear about it that much anymore, but it was like a big deal what denomination you were, right? If you're Lutheran or Methodist or Presbyterian or, or even throw Catholics in there, Catholic or Protestant, you know, so, so all of those things are classifications and not to... Um, simplify eternity in this way, but I'm going to do it. But after being in heaven for 50 million years, do you think any of those classifications are going to matter? No. But the one that is going to matter is right here. To those who are perishing, the cross is folly. To those who are being saved, it is the power of God. To those who are perishing for all of eternity, to those who are being saved for all of eternity... These tribes matter because these tribes see the cross in a vastly different way from one another. They have different perspectives. Now, I loved our dog, Bruno. We got him um, right when we first got married. He was our first kid. And I don't want to, I know the dog's not a kid, but for us, it was our first kid, right? And uh, he was a great dog. We just had to put him down uh, right after COVID started in the beginning of 2020. And he was like 16 uh, plus years old, and uh, it was really hard to do that. And he was a great dog. He would get uh, ear infections all the time, and um, we'd have to take him to the vet, and the vet would give ear drops uh, for his ear. And um, by the way, he ended up going deaf. Uh, I don't know from the ear infections or if it's just because he was so old. But he went deaf, and that's not a bad thing, by the way, to have a deaf dog. They're just not barking ever. They're just cool, and they're calm, and they chilled out. And, um, and, and so, but we had to go to the vet. Bruno didn't like the vet, and so he, he didn't want to be at the vet. He loved being in the car, but even when he's in the car, he could recognize the vet's office as we pull up. And he didn't want to be there at all. He hated the place. But we had a different perspective. We wanted to be there because we knew that he, what he needed was there. He, we needed to get those eardrops for him so that he could be healed. In the same way, the perishing looks at the cross as folly, as old wives' tales, as mythology, as ki- uh, kids' stories. But for those who are saved, those who are being saved, we see the cross in a different way. We see the power of God on display in the cross of Jesus Christ. Steve Chalk and Alan Mann, they claim to um, be in the Christian camp. They call the cross, the concept of the cross, as cosmic child abuse. They say that it contradicts the idea that God is love. They say that the cross would make a mockery of Jesus' teaching to love your enemies and not repay evil with evil. George Bernard, who wrote the hymn, The Old Rugged Cross, verse 2, said, Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. Very different perspectives on the cross of Christ. The cross is the place where our salvation was purchased by our Savior Jesus. It is the power of God to atone for our sin, to make us right with God, 
so that we could be forgiven and restored as his son or daughter. Verse 19, Paul quotes Isaiah 29, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. God's ways are wiser, even though they appear to be folly to those who are perishing. God's ways are the best ways. And so he says in verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So the second thing that the cross does that he says to us is that the cross demonstrates that God's folly has outsmarted human wisdom and his weakness has overpowered human strength. So where is the one who is wise? Wise people in the day were the philosophers, the thinkers, the, the Stoics, the Epicureans, the Sophists. They like to talk and debate about different philosophies of life, but they didn't understand the cross. Where is the scribe? Where is the theologian? The person who knows the Old Testament, who can quote you the whole Torah, but they didn't get Jesus. They don't understand the cross. It's folly to them. It's a stumbling block, he goes on to say to the Jews. Where is the debater of this age? Where is the one who's got charisma and can get a crowd riled up to follow him? He doesn't get the cross. Those things which the world thinks are wisdom and, and are wise are actually foolish. But the cross is sublime truth from God. The world does not have ultimate answers. You can search for the world to give you the answers to life, and its wisdom will fall short every time. But the wisdom of God is that which gives people life. Now look at verse 22. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews, and the folly to Gentiles. Remember the Jews, when Jesus was doing his ministry, they would come to him and demand the sign. Even though Jesus did miracles all the time, they demanded a specific sign. They wanted to see some specific miraculous sign that were going to tell them that Jesus was the Messiah. And so they demanded it from Jesus. They also demanded a miraculous thing when Jesus was on the cross. Jesus, just come down from there. Come down from the cross, they mockingly said to Jesus. Because they demanded a sign. They wanted a supernatural thing. They wanted Jesus to perform something for them. But if Jesus would have done it, Jesus would have become sort of a carnival a sideshow that was just doing as people asked. And they would keep asking him for more signs and more signs and more signs. And if he kept doing more signs and more signs for them on their behalf or their request, who's really God? And the Greeks pursued wisdom. The, the, the Greeks loved to debate and to talk about wisdom and, and to have a bunch of head knowledge. But this is a different wisdom, this wisdom from God. It's the mystery of the cross. Both of these systems of thinking, whether those who demand miraculous gifts, those who are seeking wisdom, both of those are self-centered, worldly ways of thinking about your life. I have to see this in order to believe this. I have to understand this and have this sort of wisdom to understand this. The power of the cross is in its foolishness, which is not foolishness to those who are being saved, but yet is the power of God. Second, we see the people of the cross. Look at verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus." who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let no one who boasts, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. He reminds them, brothers, he says, verse 26, these are Christians, they're struggling Christians, they're sinful Christians, 
The church isn't doing well with these Christians, but they're still Christians. They're brothers in Christ because of the cross. And he says to them, not many of you were wise. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. He doesn't say not any of you. He says not many of you. So these are average, ordinary citizens in Corinth. They didn't have anything special going on. They, they weren't rich and wealthy. Not many of them were. In the 1740s, there was a movement in our country called the Great Awakening. It was also overseas as well. But here, um, men like uh, George Whitfield and, and the Wesley brothers, they brought the gospel uh, to people who were starving and hungry to turn to Christ. And many tens of thousands of people turned to Jesus Christ, called the Great Awakening. And many of them in, in the revival were lower income people. And, and they worked uh, in the trades, in the farms, and and the uh, Industrial Revolution hadn't happened yet, but they were poor people, by and large, that came to Christ. He says here, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. But in the 1750s, there's one person who came to Christ. One of the most notable ones was a woman named the Countess of Huntington. She used to say that she was saved by an M that it was many, not many of you were this way. He didn't say not any, but not many. And so she was saved, she was well-to-do, she was, she was of influence. The church is made up of all of these types of people, but in Corinth, and I would kind of argue too, even today, not many of people in the church are the influential people. In the second century, there was a, historian named Celsus, he wrote about Christians that all of Christians were basically losers. Here's what he says. Here's this quote. Their injunctions are like this. Let no one educated, no one wise, no one sensible draw near, for these abilities are thought by us to be evils. But as for anyone ignorant, anyone stupid, anyone uneducated, anyone who is a child, let him come boldly. He said this, the Christians would say this, by the fact that they themselves admit that these people are worthy of their God, they show that they want and are able to convince only the foolish, the dishonorable, the stupid, only slaves, women, and children. Sorry, women. But in fact, it has been shown repeatedly that Christians in the first century and today were from all walks of life. However, there is something to be said about those who come to Christ. That Jesus, he said this for a reason. It's easier for the rich man it's easier for the camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of heaven. Because a rich person has their felt needs met. They have what they are thinking they need. And for those who don't have much, for those who are down and out, their need for Christ, it seems as if God uses that to point them to Christ in a different way. And for this person who's got it all, Sometimes it takes God taking it all away from them for them to snap out and to see their need for a Savior, for their need for Christ and the cross. He says to these brothers, not many of you had it all going on, but, look back at the text, verse 27, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things are not to bring the things to nothing, the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Did you see that? God chose three times, and because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Never forget, brothers and sisters, you might have prayed a prayer. You might have trusted in Christ, absolutely. But you're only in Christ, and you only believe in Jesus and accept the cross for your salvation because God did the work in you. God chose us, and if we don't remember this, we'll be tempted to selfishly take the credit and to think, wow, I've done it, and I've lived a good life. I've accomplished so much. That is the way that we work as people with egos. 
we're selfish. You need not, not believe me, but let me ask you a question. If I found a picture of your graduating high school class, I had a picture of them. I said, here, here's your graduating class. Who's the first person you look for? Yourself, right? Um, when you think back on things in your life, you, you tend to think in terms of yourself as being better than you actually were. You ever been in an argument with somebody? Like a real big argument. And, uh, and you get done with it, and then later on in the day, you start to think about things like, man, I, I wish I would have said that, or I wish I would have said that. Has that ever happened to anybody? Anybody want to be bold enough to think, man, I wish I would have had that to come back? Yeah, you think about that. And so you think of that way, and then, but, it, but then you kind of think, well, I still won the argument. I still won that argument. You know, and, and that's what I'm tempted to think. That's what I think a lot of times. Now, I've lost a lot of arguments, um, but I've never lost a rerun in my mind, okay? <laughs> And that's, that's how we are made. That's our ego. And so here the Apostle Paul is reminding these brothers and sisters that God chose you, God chose you, God chose you. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. God chose the cross to be displayed for you and in you so that you might be saved, yes, but so that you might show the world which claims to have the wisdom that God's ways are, are the wise ways. Now he says this, verse 30, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Now you say, what is that? What is, for us, Jesus became wisdom from God. What is that? Well, he unpacks it. Righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So this is who Jesus is for us. He's these three things. He is righteousness. Righteousness is a word used in the legal realm. How can we be right like God? How can we be right and not wrong? How can we be found not guilty? Our righteousness comes from Jesus through the cross. Because 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that we might have the righteousness of God in him. We have his righteousness. So when you receive Christ by faith, when you believe in the cross, that Jesus died for you, you join the team you become righteous actually in that moment because the righteousness of God is given to you on the basis of what Jesus has done on the cross. It's a, and, and legally now you are free from guilt. Legally you are free from the power of sin and death. You are righteous. Man, I don't know how many people need to know that. I, I just golfed the other day and most of what I did in the golf course was not righteous, Okay. And, uh, but God has declared me to be righteous because of Jesus, because of the cross, because of that shameful thing. And so legally we're righteous. The next word is, you see it in your text, uh, sanctification. Jesus is our sanctification, or some translations say holiness. This is a religious word. It has to do with the religious realm. The book of Leviticus in the Old Testament details what God's people had to do to be clean. And certain things could make them unclean. And so if you were unclean, you had to follow the rules to become clean. And if you were a sinner, which you were and are, you had to make the correct sacrifices to atone for that sin. But Jesus, as we just sang, is the Lamb of God. He's our sacrifice. He's our holiness. He's our sanctification. So he's our righteousness, legal sense, He's our um, holiness or sanctification. That's in the religious sense. And then the last one, what's the last one say? Help me. Redemption. He's our redemption. This is a, a word that has to do with social structure. He redeems us. And uh, if you were in the first century, and if you have a lot of credit card debt, um, you, you didn't want to be in the first century, okay? Because uh, we don't go to prison for that here. You don't become the debtor to a person to become their slave. If you couldn't pay your debt in the first century, say you started a business in Corinth, got a great idea, a hot dog stand here in Corinth, and, uh, or a lobster stand. There were two ports, two harbors there. A lobster would be a better idea. Well, it wasn't a good idea. It failed. And uh, so you're in all this debt. So now you and your family have to become slaves. You have to move to Athens because that was the guy that gave you the loan, and you got to become their slave until you pay off your debt. Or until a rich 
neighbor or relative comes and pays off your debt and frees you from slavery to redeem you. That's literally what Jesus does for us. He redeems us. Our debt has been paid by the cross. His blood shed for you pays for your sins so that you can be redeemed from death, redeemed from being separated from God. Redemption is in Christ Jesus. So remember all this. God chose you. God did it. God is your, Jesus is your righteousness, your sanctification, your redemption. Remember all of that so that nobody can boast. He quotes uh, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this that he understands and knows me. You see, that's why none of us have any place to boast because it's all about Jesus, and he's done it. So if you're going to boast, that's okay. It's a good thing to boast as long as you're boasting in him. Okay, last paragraph, chapter 2. The proclaimer of the cross. Look at verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not with come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of, and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. The apostle Paul came with the power of God. He came with the cross. That's what it was. He wasn't an eloquent speaker. He wasn't a great orator like Apollos. He couldn't light up a crowd and get them all fired up. He was a, a great thinker, but it more came out in his letters and his writing. He wasn't a charismatic leader that everybody got in line behind. Our world is full of all of these influences, influencers, people that um, know what they're talking about. They're great thinkers. They're great orators. They they can fire up a, a, a group of people. They have great charisma, and people follow these people. Paul wasn't that. Paul wasn't a Jordan Peterson with all his insights into the brain and psyche. He wasn't Joel Osteen, you know, with a great story and perfect hairline and awesome teeth. He wasn't Andrew Tate telling young men to be men. He wasn't Oprah Winfrey doing whatever she does or Susie Orman telling you how to invest your money. All of these people are greatly skilled, but they're missing the cross. And Paul says, I didn't come to you with a great speech to de deliver to you. I just came with the wisdom of God, which is Jesus Christ crucified, so that when you believe you know that you're not believing in me, my weakness. You see that I, I got nothing. But when you believe, you know it's all about him. That's awesome. But it's not that we don't use our minds. As we proclaim this gospel, as Paul did, we use all the things that God had given us to use. I mean, the apostle Paul, he's very humble here, but two cities before he came to Corinth, he was in Thessalonica. And he was convincing and persuading people that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. In the city before he came to Corinth, in Athens, in Acts chapter 17, he's convincing and debating with the debaters and the philosophers and the thinkers in Athens. And he was engaging with them. Paul had an incredible ability to talk to Jews and to reason with them in the Old Testament scriptures and to talk to them about how Jesus is the Messiah. But then at the next day, go to Gentiles who knew nothing of the Old Testament or the ways of Yahweh and to be able to talk to them using even quoting poets of their day to tell them about Jesus and how Jesus came to save them as well as Gentiles. Paul was an amazing man with an amazing mind that God used for his glory. Jesus also said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Your heart, is the seed of like all of your emotions and everything. And really, if you wanted to be specific in the first century, you say, I love somebody, it's your bowels, it's your kidneys. So say that to your wife today, I love you, but my kidneys, honey. 
And that's what it means. It means all, all, of, all of you. But your mind was something different. Your mind and how you think was to be for God. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, Paul writes to take captive every thought. It's not that you're thinking religious thoughts all the time. It's that you're taking captive. You're, you're thinking about what God wants you to think about. God wants you to think about your family and your work. He, he's created and given you these things for your enjoyment. But just don't forget that he's the one that gives it to you. So take thought, every captive thought to Christ. And so use your mind for sure. But don't ever think that this message is going to be received because of how good you are, how great your mind is, or how great your charisma is, or your skill. Don't ever think that it's because of you that a person's going to be saved. It's because of the cross. It's because of Jesus. He says this, Verse 5, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You know, I like altar calls. You know what altar calls are? are? You know, the pastor, preacher, he gets up and he's like, if anybody wanted to receive Christ, you know, come on up and we'll pray to receive Christ. And I'm a fan. I'm a fan of it. We don't do it often uh, here, but um, we can always pray. And, uh, but I think there's, there's something that can be kind of like a, a danger in that sometimes, or, or maybe not danger, maybe that's too strong of a word. Um, I remember in Bible camp when I was young, they'd have altar calls all the time where I was at, and, and so the, the preacher would you know, have a great message, maybe have a real powerful illustration at the end, you know, not a dry, not a dry eye in the place. And then who, come forward if you want to receive Jesus Christ. And maybe they'd wait until somebody po- came up, you know what I mean? And, uh, and maybe you're waiting there for a long time. And, and, and so there's a sort of a f- sense of manipulation that can come about because it's, it's built on the persuasion of the speaker or the one that was giving the invitation. Paul says, this is not me with you guys, Corinth. I was not that way. I was not that way Um, I came with just the cross with Christ. Because some kids, young people at these camps would come forward and they'd pray the prayer or whatever and they'd turn away from their drugs and their drinking and sex and they would turn away from all that. But then the next month they'd be back home doing the exact same thing that they said they were turning away from. And that always got me. It's like weird. It's like, are they really Christian? I think what's happening is great music's played. Emotions are built up. Not a dry eye in the place. Charismatic says, person, speaker, come on forward. And they get caught up in, 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 in the emotions of it rather than the simple truth of the cross of Christ. One youth pastor that I really respected at a youth conference, he talked to all the counselors. He said, I want to make sure all of the young people get eight hours or more of sleep a night because I don't want them be, being fuzzy thinking when they make commitments to Christ, commitments for their life, I want them to be sharp in their thinking as they turn, we pray, to Christ. Paul didn't come as a great orator or a great thinker or a charismatic leader. He just came with the cross. It's not the power of the proclaimer. It is the power of the cross. Because the cross is the symbol that's so offensive in the first century. We're so used to it today, but the cross is a symbol of two things, the severity of our sin and the great love of God. Never forget that. The severity of our sin because Christ had to die a brutal death on our behalf because of our sin, but God's love provided that salvation for you and for me so that we wouldn't be lost, that we wouldn't have to pay for our sin, but we could, by faith in Christ, be forgiven. It's on the cross of Christ, Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, that God's justice is shown. Sin is atoned for. But God is also the one who does the justifying. Forgiveness is offered. Salvation is given for all who acknowledge the cross 
as the severity of sin and the great love of God.